In a previous video, I explained that many folks use the concept of turning the other cheek in order to influence Christians to allow evil behavior to proliferate. In this video, I'd like to discuss another excuse many offer for not resisting evil. It's the concept that Christians are to obey earthly authorities, give ground to authorities. Many folks like to fling Romans 13 in the teeth of a people who talk about reform or resisting tyranny. Romans says, uh, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are be ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinances of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doth evil. Wherefore, ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute, to whom tribute is due, custom, to whom custom, fear, to whom fear, honor, to whom honor. But here again, note the lack of any word stating that one should respect an authority that does evil. Over and over again, it says the authorities are ordained by God specifically to enforce just behavior. Any authority that does otherwise is therefore not an authority in this sense. Here's the quintessential example of this in Acts 5, 27 to 32. And when they, being the apostles, had brought them, they brought the, <laughs> when, the, when the authorities brought the apostles to them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Folks, when the government does evil, it is no longer ordained by God. This idea, I think, comes from an ill-advised combination of the concept of turning the other cheek which we discussed earlier, and with the concept of obeying the government. People get the idea that when the government becomes evil, you should turn the other cheek. I think this is a deep and profound error. So how exactly do we resist evil government? I think the founders of the American Revolution laid out the framework fairly well. We owe it first of all to explain to people precisely why we intend to resist the authorities, then we resist them, as effectively as we can with as little collateral damage as is at all possible. And once the existing authorities are overthrown, we have to replace them as hastily and efficiently as possible with appropriate authorities. But studying the American Revolution does not give us a truly Christian viewpoint. The uh, revolutionary, leaders, revolutionary leaders were some of them Christian, but most of them were not devout Christians. They were sympathetic to the Judeo-Christian ethic, but they were antichrists in the vein of what it talks about in First and Second John. And what I mean by that is not the antichrist, but antichrist is in claiming Christianity, but then turning around and teaching and preaching diametrically opposed viewpoints. They called themselves Christian or Christian sympathizers, but then they turned around and resisted Christ claiming that God was not personally involved, claiming that God wasn't really exactly as the Bible foretold and all of these kinds of things. So how do we know from the Bible as Christians 
that we have the right and the duty to take military action against evil governments. Now, I would say, first and foremost, we know this because Christ told us <laughs> that the sword was not going to depart from us because of him. In Matthew 10, 34 to 36, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. More we know from God's own mouth that the time for peace passes after the crucifixion. In Luke 22, 35 to 38, again, words of Christ. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell a garment and buy one. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, there are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. And that first verse that I read is an overt statement that peace is not going to be the result of Christ's crucifixion. And the second is an overt statement that Christians can and should prepare themselves in practical, objective terms for the violence that is to come. And I think it also makes it clear that there is no need for universal militancy. We don't all need to pick up the sword and go fighting. Uh, not all Christians are called to be warriors, you know, and we have givers and translators and tongues, you know, the spiritual gifts. <laughs> I don't know that it's the spiritual gift of a warrior, but not everybody is cut out to be a warrior, but for those who are, uh, it's a duty. Another clear statement regarding the role of Christian soldiers is in Luke 3.14, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, What shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. I've seen this verse presented as purely pacifistic by folks saying do violence to no man means they should stop being soldiers. But looking at the word in the Greek makes it really obvious that it meant exactly what it looks like it means in the context, which is to say soldiers are not to do violence to people in order to extort money. They're not supposed to turn into extortionists. Yet there they are, nevertheless, soldiers. And there's, of course, Cornelius in Acts 10, who is a centurion and yet also a Christian. So we know that pacifism is not true. We know that the government is not always right and that there is a role for a just and righteous soldier. If we are called to be pacifists, it goes without saying that we should not be soldiers and we should not buy swords, and this is not the case. Therefore, we know Christians can and should fight for the just cause. So we know now that turn the other cheek is not a call to pacifism, we know that honoring worldly authorities is not meant to imply that we should allow any evil so long it is perpetrated by a government. And we know that we are allowed self-defense in spreading the gospel since we are to purchase weapons for our defense when we go out. And we know that we can be honorable soldiers. So what's next? I submit to you we have a Christian duty to take up arms against oppression. This is actually the core of the civil rights movement. Uh, modern democracy manifesting itself as majority rule with civil rights means that no one has the right to oppress the majority, but neither does the majority have the right to be unjust. You have to be just. You have to be good. You have to be good. That's key. These two ethical standards are biblical and form the foundation of Western civilization's governmental style. If we do not fight to preserve it, we will lose it, and the innocent will suffer. And we are called as Christians to protect the innocent. More on that in my next video. Thanks again for watching Christian Labor. Please like, subscribe, comment, click on an ad, or donate from the banner of our YouTube homepage. Thank you very much.